And I'm going to just really cover the funding streams in a in sort of a brief manner, as well as update everyone on what's going on right now with the funding. Thank you very much. And Jim? Hi, I'm Jim. I work at a CPA firm, and I'm going to talk a bit about some of the tax changes that came out with the COVID legislation um, and how that may result in the ability to go back and get uh, refunds in prior years returns that might have been might not have been available before. And then Sophie, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Sophie Ivanoff. I am president and owner of Vani. We are a French bakery located in Lincoln Park. Um, and we also have one in the French market that is currently closed. I'm just going to share with all of you just some of our struggles along with strategies and ideas to keep our doors open during this time. Sounds great. Thank you all so much. So I'm going to go ahead. Um, Stacy, do you, if your mic is open, feel free to just let me know when you need me to switch slides. Oh, okay, great. You can go ahead and advance to the next one since we did the introduction. Uh-oh. You can go to the next one. My name is Stacy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Love technology, right? I was trying to figure out how can I record over these slides. So that may have been a slide that I recorded over before. All right. No so problem. And just, I'm sorry, Stacy. just so everybody knows, we are going to record the session so that way we can use it um, for future use and then we'll house the recording as well. So if you um, do have any questions, feel free to utilize the chat or jump in as you see fit. Thank you. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, Colleen, for having me. I definitely think this is gonna be a great webinar. Um, again, I'm Stacey Pitts Caldwell. I work really closely with small businesses um, throughout the state of Illinois. And so what I wanted to sort of share with you are the funding options that are open. But before we go through them and I have sort of these slides for each one of the ones that we vetted and we know about, but before I just want to kind of let everyone know that yes, there has been a pause in the funding. So um, when I say that, what I mean is we're going to talk through several different streams. So the first stream we're going to talk about is the economic injury disaster loan. It also has an advanced component. We're going to talk about the city of Chicago funds, the funds from the state of Illinois for small businesses. Cook County has something coming out and then we'll, we'll sort of end with the Paycheck Protection Program. And I'll talk a little bit about the um, Downstate Stabilization Fund. Um, so Colleen, you can go back to the first one. I was just giving an overview of the funds we're gonna cover. So if we get started, I just wanna say, so the Economic Injury Disaster Loan is the very first one that um, kind of launched out. And this, this fund is, via the SBA, so the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, this is a, and go back one more, uh, Colleen, this is the advanced one, there should be one right before it, there we go. Um, so this is the loan that is for working capital, business expenses, payroll, um, which is a huge focus on payroll. The funding source, again, is the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, these are just the basic requirements that I'll go through for each stream. And so the revenue max for this one is between 35 million and 39 million based on your industry type. And what I mean by revenue max is um, this is actually how much your small business um, can max out at revenue to be able to apply for this loan. The employee max for your small business is going to be up to 500 employees, which let me just clarify that. In the state of Illinois, a small business is defined as under 500 employees and under 10 million in revenue. So just kind of keep that in mind as a framework. The loan amounts here for the EIDL is up to 2 million per business. The interest rates are 3.75% for small businesses and then 2.75% for nonprofits. So yes, nonprofits can apply for this loan. Your geographical requirement, when, I'm, when I say that some of these loans have, you have to be in Illinois or you have to be in the city of Chicago. So that's what I'm referring to there. And then how to apply. So right now, as of yesterday, you can no longer submit an application for this loan. Um, there are three loans that have been put to a halt and that is this one. 
um, and the advanced portion of it, because I'll go into it next, um, the advance is a part of this, and then also the, the paycheck protection. Um, the economic injury disaster loan has a ton of different variables. So this is just the snapshot. Um, you definitely can go on the SBA website to find the particulars of this loan, but it's in general, what's happening is they're looking at how can we help the small businesses um, with emergency funding. Typically, before they halted the funds, the loan has been taking about 20 to 30 days to complete. So the entire application process has taken 20 to 30 days. And so because of that, and we can go to the next slide, um, they introduced the EIDL advance. And so that just means basically there's a quicker way to access about up to $10,000 in funds but if you really look at it for small businesses, this is really about $1,000 per employee. That's kind of the way to think about it because it is, again, it's employee and payroll centered. Also I funded by the- I don't oh, know if sorry. it's appropriate to ask questions, but um, are, are all these other funds also out of money? So if you haven't heard from them yet, because I applied for it when it first opened, it, yeah, or so are the they only still in process? So the only funds that are out of money right now are going to be the, the funds that are filtering their appropriations, right? So they're the actual PPP is out of money and the EIDL, the SBA is now out of money. Um, that doesn't mean that it, they won't get money. And, and so I'll just speak to that right now since you asked that question. So what's happening right now is that originally um, they, the request for $349 billion was was at was uh, it was requested via the CARES Act, so that max is hit. The lenders um, have all stopped taking applications. Um, but let me let me go through. So toward the end, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Paycheck Protection Program. It's toward it's sort of at the end. So let me but just go through. But, but if your if your uh, applications are in, is it still possible to get funds out besides the PPP, or is that all on hold for any federal government loans? Yeah, it's all on hold right now. So for example, if you put an application in, you haven't heard anything back, um, we won't know until, it depends on how much money they've already issued out. And so that's something that we won't know right now. So as of right now, everything is on hold. Does that make sense? Okay, so yes, the EIDL you. advance, yeah, you're welcome. The EIDL advance is really just a 10, up to $10,000 from the other loan, from the EIDL loan. So that's why this one is also on hold because what's happening with this was just an advance to get to businesses sooner. Um, and it doesn't need to be repaid, but it does filter from the original EIDL loan. So it is also on hold. There is a separate application for this. So to my knowledge, as of this morning, they were still taking applications for the advance piece of it. Um, however, I believe that's gonna halt because the news of, of the funds being dried up just um, came out on yesterday. But this slide does still have the actual link. Um, next slide. So, to my knowledge and from what I have heard and spoke to with our partners, um, these other loans are still accepting applications. So if you are a city of Chicago uh, small business, meaning you're headquartered in the city of Chicago, um, you can still apply for the city of Chicago Small Business Resiliency Fund. It's um, the loan uses are for working capital, but at least half of that has to be for payroll and maintaining your workforce at 50% or greater for a minimum of six months. So who qualifies? The small businesses that are less than 3 million in revenue, and that's pre-COVID um, revenue. So not less than 3 million in March. Um, go back for me. Colleen, can you go back one to the, oh, sorry. Okay, for 3 million in revenue. And then also you have to have fewer than 50 employees of which half need to be Chicago residents. So that's a key um, component there for this program. Um, the loan amounts are up to $50,000. 
but they, they're qualifying that against what's your three month average monthly revenues pre-COVID. That's how they're going to look and assess the amounts that you qualify for. After that amount, it's 1% for the interest rate for the first year and a half, and then 5.75 interest rate for up to five, a five year term. Again, you have to be located in the city of Chicago for at least one year, and you do need a city of Chicago business license. So um, just wanna make sure that you guys understand that. Um, be aware that when you apply for this loan, it does put you into, um, uh, on the internet when you apply, it's through Connect to Capital. That's just the site that the city of Chicago is using to manage and hold these applications. Next slide, please. Quick question on that. Is, is that the one that originally had a limitation on you couldn't earn if you were a restaurant over $800,000 or is that a different one? That's a different one. Okay, so that, this one, okay, I didn't apply for this one, thank you. Sure. So the next one we'll talk about is also still taking applications. Um, this is the Illinois Small Business Emergency Loan Fund. Um, this fund is similar to the city of Chicago. The biggest difference is that you have to be a non-city of Chicago business in order to apply. So this applies to all of the other businesses in the suburban, um, uh, in, in the suburbs of, of Chicago, not necessarily a city of Chicago business resident. So <clears throat> this, the, this, this loan basically, same uses, right? Half of the proceeds apply to payroll, or you can also apply it to other eligible compensation, but um, just keeping in mind compensation caps at $100,000 per employee. The funding source for this one is the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. We call them the CEO for short. Um, same max here, so the three million in annual annual revenue. Your employees have to be less than fifty employees. Um, this is also a, a, up to fifty thousand dollars offered as a five year term loan, and it's a simple interest rate of three percent. Again, it excludes city of Chicago businesses. So for all of you small business owners who are not in the city, this is an opportunity for you to apply. The you can go to the next one. Um, I will say that one is also managed through Axion. So you'll see when you click the link and it takes you directly to Axion, that is still the correct loan opportunity. So the next one is a, a newer one. It's not open yet. Um, this is Cook County Community Recovery Initiative. And this is a new one that's really, um, I'm, I wanted to share with you guys because it's focused on sort of my smaller micro businesses and even gig workers, independent contractors, um, you know, the smaller businesses here. So again, this is this is Cook County Board President, Tony Pretwinkle. She announced this, $10 million. Um, she announced it on back on April 7th. It's a no interest loan to suburban small businesses, get gig workers and independent contractors whose livelihoods have been battered by the new coronavirus. It's a one-time, five-year loan of up to $20,000 for small businesses. And then here's the key, up to $10,000 for independent contractors. Um, the, the application period is gonna be first come, first serve. They're gonna open it. It should open May 1, that's kind of what we heard. But there is an interest form that you should absolutely submit now if you are interested in this loan. And so basically, if, if you, the, the link is on here, so I'm sure we'll share this, but um, go ahead and submit that interest form so that when the application opens up, you can, you can get it right away. The revenue max is, again, less than $3 million for, um, for businesses. Independent contractors have to earn less than $100,000, but half of that has, they have to prove that half of their work or their income comes from contract work. So that's going to be the cue. There, um, the employees is less than 25. You can get 20K, up to 20K for small businesses and 10K. I think I already mentioned that. And then you must have locations or reside outside of Chicago. Is this just for Cook, uh, this question, is this just for Cook County or is that? It is. This is outside of Chicago, so it's not like someone in Lake County or, or DuPage, correct? 
For, correct. For right now, that's where that's what we have. We don't have the, the geographical details. I pulled this from our, our partner over at Cook County, and this is kind of what they're they're saying. So my assumption will be if they get any more funding than the 10 million, they may be able to do something different. But right now, yes, this is Cook County, but not City of Chicago. Got it. Thanks. Oh, hi, Sean. I didn't know that was you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> All right, so this is the one everybody wants to talk through, and I don't want to like hijack the whole <laughs> presentation, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. But um, basically, the Paycheck Protection Program, so that everyone understands, you know, my goal is so for the small businesses understand why and how this plays into the the SBA. So basically, there was 349 billion that was released via the CARES Act to provide small um, or payroll protection for small businesses via their bank, right? So this, this program is actually managed by your business bank. So if you are a, um, you know, a Chase customer, you have to go through your bank to access these funds. As of yesterday, they are not accepting any more applications because they have hit 338 billion of fund requests already within in less than two weeks. So right now, as of this morning, um, Congress was asked for $250 billion more, um, but that was not yet approved. It's not approved. They're still in negotiations. And just so you guys know, I thought this was important to note that um, the conflict is really the money being sort of diverted to healthcare facilities and state local budgets versus small business. And so, and that's really the conflict. So that's where the negotiations are happening. So we should hear something pretty soon because there's a lot of pressure and you guys have heard this to for small businesses. Um, but just so you know, so when this opens up again, if, it flow, if the money gets appropriated and flows through again, you'll know and be ready to apply. What you need to know is that you can only apply with your business lender. So call your banker, use your online portal. However, whoever you do have your banking, your business banking relationship with, that is who you need to work with. Um, the specifics on this one is basically that 75% of the amount that you request has to go to your payroll. So that's bringing people, rehiring people, if you've laid them off, if you've furloughed any employees, bringing those people back on um, between I think up into up through, uh, I'm looking at the date, sorry, here, June 30th is the date that you would need to do this by. So basically 75% of whatever you're going to ask for through this, um, through this loan, and it's up to 10 million, but basically it's determined by eight weeks of your 2019 average payroll, right? So whatever your 2019 average payroll is, that's what they're looking at. That's how they're going to assess how much to give you. So based on that, 75% of, of that money that they give you needs to go back into hiring and keeping your employees. 25% of that can be used for utility for your space, your location, your rent, um, and things of that matter. But that's a, an important note because when you apply, they're going to ask for your payroll documents and that you're, you'll need to have that in order. Less than 500 employees is the employee max. Um, there, there wasn't a revenue max that I could find, and I've spoken to several people at the SBA, so right now that's not specified. Um, it's, you know, it is a national, a federal program, so the ge geographically anyone can apply. And then basically, you just need to work with your lender. So there is no one, there is no generalized application link. What I did share here is what the SBA kind of came up with to give you an example of what would what you would need to have in order to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program. Stacey, it's Colleen. There's been a couple of questions popping up in the chat about sure. um, PPP. Um, one question was, I've heard that if you were approved for PPP, that you cannot apply for the EID loan. Is that true? No. So that's not true. Um, the EIDL loan is specifically from the SBA. And so as a part of, if you apply for an EIDL loan first, then, and you were, and you were approved for that, 
you could still apply for the PPP via your lender. Now, that said, it is up to your lender because they, they have sort of oversight on how to issue these funds to their clients or their customer, banking customers. So it may be the case that your particular lender has um, asked you for information of everything you've applied for and they're using that as criteria to see who to fund these loans and they are able to legally do that. Thank you. And there's another question. I'm assuming that the Illinois small business loan is not forgivable. Is the PPP the only forgivable loan? Yes, um, the PPP is the only forgivable loan. Um, and the EIDL advance is also forgivable, th that portion of it. So um, that 10,000 up to 10,000, 1,000 per employee that we talked about earlier, that is um, not have that does not have to be repaid if you are then approved for the longer EIDL loan. So let's simplify that. If you if you put in a request for fifty thousand dollars to the EIDL and then you went and applied for the advance and got three thousand dollars, you do not have your loan will not be fifty three thousand dollars. Your loan will be fifty thousand dollars. Okay, great. Thank you. There's a couple more questions popping in. We're going to keep moving forward and then we'll answer the questions at the end. Yes, sure. the recording and the slides will be available to everybody who um, RSVP for the session. So we will get that to everybody as soon as we're done. Great. Um, this one I won't take too much time on. It is a very, very specific opportunity. Um, it's called the Downstate Small Business Stabilization Grant. And so this is a grant, so this is not a loan, but you have to, the, the key here is that the funding source is from the Community Development Block Grants. And so there's some heavy requirements around this, but if you are, if you are looking for opportunities and you're not located um, in the city or you don't qualify for some other things, you can make an application and an appeal directly to a local unit of government. So wherever you are, whatever county you're in or whatever, um, um, whatever um, village you're in, and you may be able to, um, great, yes, here's the map for this. So if you look at the areas that are sort of in the stripes there, the, the stripe, the slanted stripes there, those are called entitlement areas. So those do not qualify. So take a look at this. There's a lot of detail here. So basically, um, you have to have been operating since January 2017 at a minimum. You have to provide documentation on the health of the business. You have to enter a participation agreement with local government. Um, and funds may also be used for for-profit small businesses that are cons considered non-essential. There's a whole application process, very detailed information, and a guidebook online. So when these slides are sent, you can click that link. Um, and so the next, and I just wanted to give you these resources. These are much smaller, more localized resources, but I have spoken with all of these partners and verified these opportunities. So Facebook has some information coming. Um, this could include ad credits, some cash grants, and maybe even a loan. Um, you can go there to check that out. Yelp, for those small businesses that are retail um, type of businesses or businesses heavily relying on reviews and, and customer um, in, in engagement, they have some upgrades available, other services. So click on those links to find those out. GoFundMe has an initiative that um, different businesses and corporations are donating to, but you can also apply for the funding at small business. So you want to take a look at that. Um, and then the last one is the Verizon Small Business Reco Recovery of Funds. They closed their first round and now they're going to reopen their next round. So you can go ahead and submit your interest for that and see if you qualify there. Um, all this information is a lot. And so if you are, if you are really interested in kind of going one, one um, with me about your small business and what you may qualify for, um, you can go to the next slide, Colleen. You can simply email me and then I'll get you, you know, the information you need to become a virtual client of our Illinois SBDC at the chamber. And then we can talk one-on-one -on -one and have a 30 minute call. So I just wanted to go over that. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Thank you, Stacey. And as I mentioned, we will be sending the recording as well as the slides. And I'll also be saving any chat questions that are in there. So if we don't get to all of the questions in the time we have allowed, um, we will make sure to follow up with everybody with these answers as well. 
So Jim, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to you a bit. All right, let's see, I should be on, on mute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, you're all set. All right, great, thank you. So we'll take a look at some of the other uh, things that the CARES Act did, like they changed some tax things that may create opportunities to either reduce your payments for taxes in the current period or go back to prior periods and get a refund where some refunds might not have been available. So I'll try to go through this fairly quickly in that. Um, and just as general, these, this is really just general observations and guidance that the tax is, of course, very, very complicated. These issues are really interrelated. It depends on specific situations and tax filing statuses and all kinds of stuff. Um, there's another wrinkle that the IRS and the Treasury Department doesn't really exactly know how all this stuff works. They're still make, doing interpretations and clarifying and coming up with the methods to apply for all these things. And so it's very, very fluid right now, but this is what's out there so far with that. And certainly speak to a tax specialist to, uh, to find out about your specific situations and circumstances, what might be available in that. And so uh, we'll take a look at some of the, first of all, there's a layer of tax credits that may be available uh, because of the, the new acts and that. And we'll look at a couple of those there. The, the first is the employee retention credit. And um, that is, um, available to, oh, you can go ahead. I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly here. So um, that's a, that's first of all, it's a refundable tax credit against your share, the employer's share of social security. And so when you calculate the amount of the credit you have, you can actually subtract that from the amount that you would have to fund for your social security deposit and reduce your, your deposits to the state. The IRS and the treasurer have already said, yeah, that's okay. No penalties for not, not funding that as you otherwise would have to do in that. Um, and if, and if, you're, if the amount of your funding doesn't cover the amount of your credit, you can request a, an advance payment back from the IRS on those. And so that's the opportunity to, uh, to reduce your tax burden in the current period in that. Um, the eligibility requirements of that is that you would have a business that's fully or partially suspended by the government. This is on the next slide, by the way. Um, gross receipts had to have fallen 50% below the court com comparable quarter last year. And so, if your business is off by half, you're, uh, you're qualified with that. Um, it does apply to nonprofits as well as other businesses in that, but it does not apply to state and local governments. And so there is uh, quite a bit of opportunity to, uh, to, to save on some of the filings in the current period in that. So calculating the credits on the next slide there, and that's 50% uh, of all qualified wages, up to $10,000 per, per employee that are paid from March 13, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. And so you can calculate that off, see how much that is. Um, if you have less than 100 employees, then it's a credit on all wages to all employees. If it's 100 or more employees, then it's just on those that didn't work in the calendar quarter. And so that depends on your size and how you calculate those things. Um, you can get a PPP loan with this, but if you do, the amount of those payments aren't eligible for the retention credit. And so um, you can't get the you can't get the BPP and then pay people and claim the credit and that uh, that'd be a little bit of a double dip but it does do that it also doesn't include any wages that you've got a credit for under the uh, paid sick and family leave under the first family coronavirus act which we'll take a look at right away now so moving on to the next section there um, this is uh, this was a requirement that that came in under the uh, the um, the coronavirus legislation that uh, really expanded the paid sick leave and the Family Medical Leave Act. And this was for employees that were either diagnosed with coronavirus or symptoms and they weren't allowed to work, or they had a family member who had those symptoms. In some circumstances, it would be that somebody had to stay home, a parent had to stay home because daycare wasn't available and, um, and there was expanded Family Medical Leave Act funds that, that, um, that that companies would have needed to expend for those things. So the next slide we can see that um, it, it gives, a, um, it gives a, um, a dollar for dollar refundable credit. So you have to track the amount that you paid under these two programs. So either that employees were sick with coronavirus or they're on family medical leave and you get a fully refundable credit for that. Again, they're not, uh, they're not those wages that are paid are not eligible wages for the retention credit. So they're, they're mutually exclusive with that. Um, and if you are self-employed, there's similar, there's similar credits that are available for self-employed workers too. And so that might be available if somebody is an independent contractor or run their own business and things like that as well. Um, again, on the next slide then, um, this is another one that you can reduce your payroll taxes 
withheld from employees um, your, the funding you do for your payroll taxes by the amount of the credit. And again, that's okay. They've said that's okay. There's no penalties for not making the deposits when required in that. And again, you can claim any excess credit to get a refund at, on the, uh, the employment tax return in that. And so you can also, under certain circumstances, get that reimbursement of that accelerated with that. They are trying to, uh, trying to again, be very, very helpful through these credits and keeping everybody afloat with that. So um, on the next one, we'll take a look at some of the tax changes that came about with this. And this was actually changing the tax, uh, tax laws, and this had to do with the 2015 tax changes. There were some things in there that were overridden, some things that were clarified in that, and some things they, they put in just to, again, increase the amount of cash flowing. And, and first of all, this first one is for um, the nonprofits that, um, that there's, a, there's now the ability, and it was changed in 2015, where you couldn't take an above the line deduction for charitable contributions. And they put that back in now where a person who doesn't itemize, you take the standard deduction, you can, you can take an additional deduction for up to $300 in cash contributions made to qualifying charitable organizations. So any nonprofits out there that rely on the support of the public for things may wanna get the word out that they now, it's beneficial for the taxpayer and it's certainly helping them out, but they can get the, uh, the taxpayers are now right up up to $300 with that. Um, they also increased the limitations of charitable contributions during 2020. Um, it was 60% and 10% for corporations. That's now 100% of AGI for individuals and 25% of taxable income for corporations and that. And you can now carry that forward the uh, excess uh, excess contribution for it for five years and that. Um, on the next one then, uh, this was a lot of detail that they changed with these. Um, and uh, some of the... the oh, Jim, oh, yes. Colleen, I just wanted to jump in really quick. We did have a question pop up about the emergency sick leave. Is it available for those um, that are in danger or high risk categories of taking off work for example, a worker that had cancer, autoimmune conditions, does that apply? Possibly. It would depend on the circumstance and the documentation on that, but that's certainly something to speak to your employer about because there are, there are some allowances for those things. But again, it depends on the circumstances with that. Okay. Um, the first one was, and these are things that may result, depending on your, your circumstance, in a refund that you may be able to apply for for a prior period. Um, the first one is modifications for the use of net operating losses. And in the 2015 uh, tax uh, update, the, this was restricted to only the last couple years. Now you can take not, uh, not, uh, net operating losses back up to five years, uh, beginning with calendar year uh, uh, 2020, uh, 2018, 19, 20 can go back five years. And so, you can't yet do anything for 2020 yet. At the end of 2020, if there's a net operating loss, that can roll back up to five years. It goes back to the earliest of the years and can generate a refund for those things because now you had a, if you had, assuming you had a net profit situation, you pay taxes, you can apply that loss back there and apply for a refund of the taxes that you paid in the prior years. Um, but it also applies to 2019. So if, if a company did or an organization had a net operating loss, in 2019, those losses can now go back five years and, and be applied to prior income that was paid in the prior five years. So again, something to look at depending on what your circumstance was for um, those prior years. Um, the second one was the, uh, the modification of limitation of losses. And so losses are, are, were generally capped at $250,000. Um, you couldn't carry those back or forward or get any credit for any loss over that. Um, they've now expanded that, and so it could be that if you have a company who hit their net operating losses in the prior years, there may be more available there in terms of applying losses against taxable income. And again, that could result in a refund if you, if you looked and refiled your taxes on that. Um, the third one relates to interest paid by businesses, so on any lines of credits in that. Um, it was, uh, it increases the limit from 30% of AGI to 50% of AGI for uh, 2019 and 2020. And so that would be another thing if you pay a lot of interest and uh, going back and looking to see if that now additionally, that additional calculation may again result in, in a, a refundable position on a prior return on that. Um, the really, uh, the last one is a really, is a really big deal. It really was put in there as a technical correction. It was really somewhat missed in the, uh, in the, uh, the Tax Act of 2015 in that. Um, there, was three, there was three categories of, of property, and this really relates to 
Um, improving existing properties in, on interior improvements, non-residential, um, but making improvements, so redecorations, you know, building out the interior, um, if you rent apartments, fixing up the apartments, things like that. Um, there was three categories of that. It was restaurant property, real, uh, retail improvement property, and then leasehold improvements were all separate categories in the prior tax law. And in 2015, they were all brought into this big group called QIP, or Qualified, qualified, uh, qualified Improvement Properties. And when they drafted the law, when they drafted the tax law, they didn't address that correctly, and they made it a 39-year depreciation life, life, and so they weren't eligible for bonus depreciation. And what they did just change in the CARES Act was, was that those three categories, so if you have a restaurant and, you know, redid the interior, put in a new oven, things like that, you could now claim bonus depreciation on those for prior year purchases, um, going back even, uh, going back into prior years, even where there's, even where there's higher tax rates, and claim the deduction for that now. And so it's again an, an opportunity where it may be appropriate to refile prior year taxes to recalculate all these different the, all these different methods of calculation of net income, claim these credits, and then you get a refund on any income that, on any taxes that were paid in those periods. And those things will be able to carry back five years in that now. So um, it's really, really a, an opportunity for tax planning as well. And again, it's the best thing to do is speak to your tax professional about, you know, is it is it appropriate to look at reopening your taxes in the prior in the prior years, recalculating what your your tax liability should have been, and see if any of those credits were uh, see if any of those credits may be impactful for you in getting a refund. So um, that's it for me for taxes. I think that's just ooh, okay, that one got all kind of messed around there. I think there oh, there's a number on the bottom. That's okay. So <laughs> formatting sorry. a little. Four men got a little money there, but that's okay. So, um, so yeah, so that's that's about taxes, and they're here to help. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim. I really appreciate it. Again, um, Jim and Stacy, if you want to uh, look at the chat and pop in and answer any of the questions that may have popped up, again, we're going to save the chat functionality as well as the slides. And so, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce you to Sophie. She's on the call with us right now. Um, she gave her intro in the beginning, but. I've seen, I've known Sophie for probably five plus years now, um, and I'd like to just have her talk a little bit about, you know, what's the experience right now as a small business owner in the city of Chicago, as well as how do you stay relevant um, during this kind of trying time. So take it away, Sophie. Hi, thanks, Colleen. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to share some of my experiences and hopefully you guys can relate and just get a few takeaways. So we started this journey we had three stores and I permanently closed a location in Hyde Park. That store was already not doing very well and there was no way we were gonna get through this. So we needed to make quick decisions on how to make sure Vinny was still gonna be around for 10, 20, 30 years. So with that, we did do some layoffs. I did have to lay off um, someone in our upper management team. It was very difficult for me. Um, and then we put the rest of our employees on furlough. Uh, we started this journey with four managers. We met and we decided we were not going to close and we were just going to do what we can do and just go day by day like everyone else. And so we initially started with um, a massive promotion. We did um, a double your order plus free shipping. So essentially we were just breaking even. That, that's been our goal is just to generate cash flow and break even. Um, we were sitting on inventory we needed to burn through uh, and this was a great opportunity just to just keep getting the brand out there. Um, you get, do you want to go to the next slide? Colleen, I can kind of, some of the things I touched on, I can get into more. So with the continual promotions, we were generating new ideas, new products, probably every two days. I uh, took over social media. I am not good at social media to be honest it's not my forte i'm learning as i go but i started doing it personally i started doing our own newsletters we're putting a newsletter out every two days now we're maybe doing it twice a week we're making it personal new products we're taking headlines pop culture um and we're just we're just turning it into being fun i know not everyone is not in food service or a bakery and can make cakes you know, but whatever your services or your company, find ways to be current, 
find other companies that you can partner with. We hit up some Instagram influencers and they were more than willing to help. That's another thing today. Everyone is more than willing to help if you're a small business. You know, where some Instagrammers you have to, they want fees to post anything. Not today. They're all more open arms. What can we do to help? Um, so you, if your doors are not open, you want to at least be focusing on social media and content. So you're top of mind. So when you do open, you're still connecting with your customers. Uh, we also did a huge community um, driven program. It's called Chicago Strong. Again, it was lunch bags and breakfast bags designed at cost for essential workers. So people can sponsor. We've had um, companies sponsor. And that was able to let us bring some of our furlough employees back because we just we needed people just to do work. Um, and our all of our messaging is focused on positivity, humor, we're bringing in humor. And what we found is people want comfort and they want things to do at home. Um, so any, your service industry, any videos you can do to share and just keep connecting and be honest. In our newsletters, I generally have started with personal comments and sentiments for me personally, just letting everyone know what we're going through. And, you know, it's a good way to connect. There's some of our, so we did a, um, we have cupcakes, so we honored, we did one with Dr. Fauci on it, it's a stud muffin. Um, the memes with Lori Lightfoot, uh, we did a cake, and that was one of our examples. We actually partnered with him to do a contest for people to make their own Lightfoot memes. Um, and that literally was just, I just sent him a DM on Instagram, and he was more than willing to help out. And through all this, too, we've gained 1,200 new followers on Instagram because everyone is on their phone right now. So anything you can get out there, there people are looking at it. Yeah, I think this is great. Um, I started seeing Sophie's um, messages on Instagram and I was like, man, are you staying super relevant right now in everything that's going on? There was even a video with Mayor Lightfoot. Um, I think she had gotten some macaroons from you guys, but her face is on them and I thought that was pretty awesome. And then also just, um, you know, how, you know, I, I truly applaud your, your business. Um, they were doing um, deliveries. And so I live on the far south side of Chicago, nowhere near one of Sophie's bakeries. And so they did like Thursday south side drop off. And so a whole bunch of people were doing drop offs on the south side, which I thought was really great. Um, and, you know, especially like the decorating kits, especially if you're home with the small children right before the holidays, I thought that was awesome. So kudos to you guys on um, staying relevant and, you know, also tuning up your own skill sets to try and make things um, work for everybody at the organization. Yeah, I just, a couple of things too, like all these photos that you guys see, they're done on our phones. So uh, we're not doing anything fancy, like we're literally taking it on our phone and then we're just using, um, there's a, like, just look it up. There's a, it's called Canva. So it's a website and an app where you can design flyers and images and it's free. So a lot of these, they were just done in that app. Um, and so that's, that's been really helpful. So, I mean, we're not, we're all doing it in house. And I think another thing, just trying to find positives too, I mean, you are going to reopen, so focus on what needs to get done. Use this as opportunities. Um, for me, you know, I don't know a lot of leaders, we overthink. And so what this has taught me, too, is not to overthink. We come up with an idea and we do it. We're not sitting on it, and I'm not trying to plan a marketing plan and this plan and who we're going to send it to. You just do it because that's, that's the day we're in now. You just got to be present and just get it out. Great stuff. Thanks so much. So I'm going to go ahead and um, open up the chat to see what additional questions have come in. Um, you got a great design. Um, kudos from Stacy. So way to go, Sophie. Um, also, thank you, Stacy. Shared a whole bunch of information in the chat. Again, I'm going to be saving this chat function. If you would like to know how to save the chat functionality yourself, you should see um, where you would type the message, a box with three little dots. If you choose that, um, you should be able then to save it and it'll, when the session's over, it'll save it as a rich text file. If not, I am saving everything for everybody. Um, so don't you worry, you'll get all this information. 
I also wanted to share with you um, my contact information. So if you do have any questions, feel free to let us know. You know, we're building out our programming um, fast and furious for um, all of our business owners that we're working with within the hub. We also have a COVID-19 link directly on our website. So you can choose there and that it will be directing you to all the resources that are available through the Loyola Business Leadership Hub. But as questions arise, um, if there was something that you didn't capture during the webinar or didn't have a question that was answered, feel free to let us know and we're always happy to um, you know, respond and let you know um, what's the most appropriate resource that we have for you at the university. Um, we have about five more minutes or so. I wanted to open it up to see if there was any additional questions that anybody may want to have. Your lines are all muted right now, but feel free to go ahead and unmute your mic to ask the questions to any of our panelists. Or not, that's okay too. Um, so this is this is Michael. I'm just wondering. I listen to the loans that are available, but I wonder if if actually looking at the tax strategies long run, if you don't need the cash immediately, is a is a better long term strategy for managing the cash flow in your business. Stacy or Jim, do you want to field that question? Yeah, that's a great question. I would ask Jim to um, talk about it from the tax perspective. I think I think that's a good idea, but um, you do have to be in a, a pretty decent cash flow um, right now. But Jim, what do you think? Are you still on? Yeah, I, I think it, I think that's a, a good question. It depends on, you know, like everything else, it depends on your particular circumstance and that. Um, the two aren't mutually exclusive, though. I mean, the uh, the tax credits are. I mean, if you're going to get the employee, uh, the employment credits, those are somewhat exclusive from getting the, uh, the the loans and that, but certainly the the look back and prior year returns and that is available to everybody, irrespective of whether or not you get a, a PPP or a uh, an emergency an emergency loan. Um, and so really, it's uh, you know the taxes are are based on circumstances and and should there be something in the prior years or some opportunity there, that certainly is a good avenue to go down too at least. Thank you. Any additional questions that we may have? Yeah, I, I had a question. Can you hear me? This is Othello. Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had a question uh, with, for Jim about, you mentioned about the, uh, the refunds uh, that you check with your uh, tax advisor. Is, is that just for, because of the coronavirus, is the option rolled out or is that, you know, say next year? Because I know most people have already filed for their taxes in 2000. 20 and 2021, um, can they still, uh, you know, go for those refunds? Those. those uh... Oh yeah, um, yeah. The way the uh, the way that the um, well uh, the way they all work is it gives you an opportunity to amend your returns in prior years. And so, for example, on the net operating loss carryback, if you had a loss in 19 and profit in you know 17, uh, 16, you couldn't roll it back that far. Now you now you may be able to. And so you would go back, amend your 2019 return and claim the credit in that and apply for a refund. And um, on some of those other ones, uh, again, they roll backwards too. And so if you built out, for example, if you had a restaurant and in 2018 put a lot of money into redoing the interior of that, um, you, would have a, you would have taken those, the, the cost of that and you'd amortize that over 39 years. What this did was they, they it really it didn't have much to do with coronavirus, but it was convenient they put it into this this bill. They got the, it was technically what they say is that you know Congress always meant for it to work this way. They just forgot when they when they wrote the final bill, and so they would uh, they would go you could go back and say okay now it's a 15 year now it's a 15 year depreciation. So you get a lot more depreciation, which is a lot more uh, expense and reduces your taxable income. Plus, you get the bonus depreciation, which brings it even further back, and so you have a bigger write-off in 2018, and you may be and you may be able to claim a, a refund on the taxes you paid in 2018 because of that. And so that's why all this stuff kind of cascades back. They they weren't all directly related to it, but they were a way to uh, have companies go back and see if they might be able to free up some from cash from what their prior uh, tax positions were. Great, thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Any additional questions? 
Okay. Well, I just want to thank so much our panelists for taking time out of your super busy days today. Um, I really appreciate all of your insight. It was a wealth of knowledge. Again, we are recording the session, so everybody will get a copy of the recording as well as a copy of the slides um, as soon as we get the recording digitized. But you'll be all set to go. If you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or any of the panelists that have shared their information. And I just want to say again, thank you so much. Um, we're here for you. So if you do have any additional questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much all for your time today. Thanks so much, Carlene. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you so much.